Palm Sunday is one of the toughest workouts of the church a year. We get literal physical exercise at the beginning of the service when we reenact Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. But of course, most importantly, it's a workout in the spirit walk that we take today, beginning in exaltation and acclaim and ending in complete despair. Part of the reason we read this huge chunk of the gospel today and act it out together as we do is to experience, to live out as directly as we can, this staggeringly epic tragedy crammed with such overwhelming momentum into the last few hours of Jesus' life. Today is the day we take in the enormity of all of that. And obviously there's an infinite number of things to think about and to preach about, but as the gospel reading for this day is by far the longest of the church here, the sermon should and today will be relatively short. I just want briefly to call your attention to two things, one of which gives birth to the other. The first has to do with what Luke tells us immediately after Jesus dies on the cross. Jesus takes his last breath, the centurion pronounces him innocent, and then Luke writes, when all the crowds who had gathered there for this spectacle saw what had taken place, they returned home beating their breasts. But all his acquaintances, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. So Luke tells us there are two groups of people here. One is those who came for the spectacle, the show, which is what public executions were for a lot of people for many centuries all over the world, and in some places still are. These people came to be entertained in this ghoulish way. And Luke tells us that at the conclusion of what happened, this group returned home beating their breasts. Now in the Bible, beating a breast is an expression of grief of sorrow. So evidently, these people came to be of the same mind as the centurion, watching through the, the, watching the spectacle, living through it themselves. They came to feel that the crucifixion of Jesus was a terrible injustice, and probably for some of them, an injustice that they felt they had somehow helped to perpetrate. So they beat their breasts, they showed their remorse and contrition. But they do that on their way home. They leave. So then the story is over. The other group stays. According to Luke, these are Jesus' acquaintances. We don't know who these people are. And the women who have followed Jesus all the way from Galilee, unlike the disciples, almost all of whom have disappeared. And unlike the people who went home because the show was over. Luke tells us that these folks stood at a distance watching these things. For them, somehow, the story is not over. It's not that they expect anything. They know they're staring into a black hole. They have just witnessed the slow, degrading torture and execution of a person whom they had seen bring the presence of God into this world in a way that no one had ever experienced before. But even though he's dead, and they have no hope, they stay and watch. Because the knowledge that God is God is in their bones. And somehow, impossible to see though it is, God is working because it cannot be otherwise. This is faith in its last resort, cold and lonely. But in God's good time, faith will come to see. Which brings us to the second thing I want to bring your attention to. Something that in these events, as we stand at a distance, and watch these things. 
that we come to see that God has done here. Something we recognize God calls us to bring into our own lives. The famous passage that we heard today from Paul's letter to the Philippians opens with Paul telling us, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. And then to explain what that means, he talks about Jesus Christ's humility. Though he was in the form of God, emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, humbled himself to the point of death on a cross. So when Paul talks about the mind of Christ, which we are to keep in us, he points to the crucifixion, which he understands is the ultimate expression of Christ's humility, of perfect servanthood. And the reason that at his name every knee should bend and every tongue confess that he is Lord. So what does this mean for us? How do we, how do we follow Christ in this? How do we understand Paul and let the mind of Christ be in us? Paul tells us in the two verses that immediately precede the passage that we heard today. They are these. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. This is life lived in the mind of Christ Jesus. Paul's words there sound so innocuous. He says it just so simply that it's easy to just walk right past how radical this statement really is. Look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. And he doesn't qualify it. He doesn't say, you do this when you can, when it's not too much trouble. He just says, do it. Well, who does? We all know that by the standards of this world, somebody who looks this way is a sap. But we also know, all of us, that when we do live that way, we get a little taste of the kingdom of God. We all know that. It's why the great Christian teacher Richard Rohr can say that of all the people he has met who are in the second half of life, the only ones who are really happy are those who have found some way to serve. We who stand at a distance and watch these things know that this is the mind of Christ. By the grace of God, may that mind ever be in us. Thanks be to God.